Well, do you need some encouragement? We're going to get some today. But, you know, it's, un it's, it's interesting. The other day I was looking uh, or thinking about encouragement, and I looked up a few things like encouraging statements, and, and I was thinking about this. And, and the, the things that people say to encourage people, a lot of times it's just positive thinking or, you know, uh, empty platitudes even, you know, just uh, without real substance. And, I mean... It's not based on anything real or solid or, or on truth. Uh, things like this. Someone will say, you can do it. Nothing's impossible. Well, it's true that with God, nothing is impossible. God, it can do anything. However, I cannot just do anything. Some things are impossible. I can't fly. All right? Even if I want to. I can't fly. So some things are impossible. Or this saying, all your dreams can come true if you have courage to do it. And that sounds very positive, very encouraging. However, I'm sorry, but if you're four feet tall, you are not going to play in the NBA. <laughs> Even if that's your dream, it's just not going to happen, no matter how courageous you are. Or... When someone's sad or discouraged and you say, things will get better, and I always want to ask, are you sure? <laughs> How do you know? I mean, things very well might get better, but what are you basing that promise on? Now, I'm not trying to be pessimistic here. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to make a point. The best encouragement is that which comes or is firmly grounded, grounded in reality. Things, uh, you could say, things will get better. How do you know? Because Mike is coming to help. Things will get better. I know because the check is in the mail. Things will get better because I know the solution. Uh, there's, a, there's a difference there. And as believers in Jesus, we have that kind of encouragement. We have hope. And it's based in truth, in reality. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks about a certain truth and sure hope that brings real encouragement. And he starts this by saying that even when we are mourning, we have hope. And so we're going to start in ch chapter 4, verse 13. But uh, before we read that, we have already read that the Thessalonian believers are living in anticipation of Jesus' return. And so it's clear that they have already been taught about it and that they know Jesus will come. But here at the end of chapter 4, we have another issue, but it's still related to Jesus' return. Uh, but they have either misunderstood something or they weren't taught about this specific issue. And it appears that this lacking information has caused them some distress as they have thought about it. And so now Paul fills in what is missing in their understanding so they can be fully informed. So we begin chapter 4, verse 13. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And so this issue has to do with believers who have died before Jesus returns. They are referred to here as those who are asleep. Asleep is being used as a euphemism for death. Uh, and, and of course, this is a good euphemism. It's fitting uh, because for Christians who have died, death is temporary. They will be raised from the dead. But Paul will expound on this. But his reason for writing about this is so Christians don't grieve in the same way as people who have no hope. He's not saying that we shouldn't grieve when our loved ones die, but that our, uh, we grieve differently. We, f we do feel deep sorrow because we've experienced loss but we are not 
hopeless. We know that when a believer in Jesus dies, it's not the end. And we know that when they die, they're not just gone. But, but he or she will be raised and will have everlasting life with Jesus. We also know that when a believer dies, they are not just experiencing some kind of nothingness, but they are with Jesus. And so in reality, those who have died as believers are actually better off now than those of us who are still living on earth. Because not only will they be raised, but they are already with Jesus. And so knowing this helps to lessen the sorrow of our mourning. And of course, we also, we also know, this means that we also know that, that as believers in Jesus, we will see each other again, even after death. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. He says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now he's explaining why we as Christians have this hope and why even our grieving is uh, eased by our hope. Our hope is rooted in the fact that Jesus died and rose again. Now both of those things are true and important. I mean, first of all, Jesus really died. He suffered on the cross and died in order to pay the price of sin. And then Jesus truly rose from the dead on the third day, breaking sin's power and conquering death. And as certain as it is that Jesus died and rose from the dead, it's that certain that the dead in Christ will also be raised from the dead. And so because we know Jesus was raised from the dead, we know for certain that all who believe in Jesus will also be raised from the dead. Because we know Jesus raised, we have and when Jesus returns, God will gather to Jesus all people who have died believing in Jesus. Now, we're not told exactly what the Thessalonians, uh, what the Thessalonian believers' confusion was here and what was causing their distress, but it clearly had to do with those believers who died before Jesus returned. It appears that they weren't, they weren't questioning the resurrection of believers, but maybe they were concerned that those who died wouldn't have the opportunity to see or experience the glorious return of Jesus. But Paul tells us that they won't miss anything. They will be gathered together to Jesus and will come with Jesus when he comes. But how does Paul know this? I mean, why would he tell them this? He tells us in verse 15. He says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So this truth comes directly from Jesus himself. He says, we declare this to you by a word from the Lord. This probably means it was a prophetic revelation. And so what did he learn from Jesus? Well, first of all, that Christians who are still living here on earth when Jesus comes will not be gathered to Jesus before those Christians who have already died. And he states this strongly. He uses the, this Hebrew, or excuse me, Greek words, ume, which means no, no. But it's a way of saying, there's no way this is going to happen. Absolutely not. 
Okay? And so he says, this won't happen. And then he continues in verse 16, and he explains further. He says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And so after he says that it won't happen, or tells us what won't happen, he now tells us what will happen. Jesus will himself come to his people. Now, right now, Jesus is in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father. But when the time is right, he will leave heaven and come to gather his people to himself. And when Jesus comes, his coming will be announced. It will be a great event. And we're told of three things that will announce his coming. There will be a cry or a shout of command. There will be the voice of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet. Now, if you read commentaries, there is a whole lot of discussion about these things. Like, is this really three separate things? Or is this three ways of describing the same event? Or this, I mean, the same thing? Uh, is, is this cry a, a literal, uh, a, a, a cry that literally wakes the dead? Or is this a cry of uh, uh, just summoning all believers to come to Jesus? And, and, and there's a whole lot of discussion about it, and we could get all caught up in these things. But those things are just not explained. We just know that there will be a cry of the voice of an archangel, the sound of a trumpet. But one thing is clear. And one thing is most important here. Jesus himself, that's what Paul says, Jesus himself will come. Jesus himself is coming. Jesus is in the spotlight here. And it, it will be a powerful and dynamic declaration of his coming. Well, let's continue reading there. The second part of verse 16, or the end of verse 16, says, and the dead in Christ will will rise first. Verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So when Jesus comes, first, all believers who have already died will rise from the dead. Then the believers who are still living on earth will join those who were raised from the dead and they will all meet Jesus together. And we will all be, he says, caught up or taken to meet Jesus in the air. This word translated as caught up could also be translated as seized or snatched. It has the idea of being taken quickly or suddenly. If this is also the word where we get our English word rapture from. Actually, our English word comes from the Latin translation of this word. The Latin word is rapturo, but it comes from translating the same Greek word. So we're talking about the rapture here. Jesus will come and he will take all believers, both living and dead, to be with him. The dead will rise first, but if you think about it, this is all going to happen very quickly. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15 says that we will be taken and changed in the twinkling of an eye. So as fast as light can glint off your eye. I mean, quick. But the important thing is this. We will all be with Jesus. Now, just as a side note, some people have questioned this idea of the dead being raised, uh, uh, of a resurrection, because uh, the bodies of people who have been de dead for many years would be completely decayed, turned to dust, maybe gone. Or there are also some people who, who when they died, were like crushed. Their bodies were crushed or were burned or eaten by animals. And people will ask them, so how could their bodies be raised? Now, this question, when it is asked, this question forgets that we are talking about a miracle. Okay? Uh, any resurrection 
is a miracle done by the power of God. And he is not limited to raising only bodies that have not, have not decayed yet. Okay? Uh, he can, he can, doesn't have to raise only bodies that are fully intact. God created everything, our bodies, the universe, everything out of nothing. He can reconstitute a dead body and raise it. He can reconstitute a decayed or destroyed body and raise it. Well, now, look at the final phrase, though, there in verse 17. He says, and so we will always be with the Lord. This is the ultimate goal. This is where we're headed. This is what we are waiting for. Every person who has put their faith in Jesus will be with Jesus forever. In John 14, 6, Jesus says this. He says, and if I go to and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is saying, I'm going to come get you so you can be with me. Where I am, you can be there too. In other words, you can be with me. Now, Jesus also mentions a place, but the emphasis is on being with him. That, that we will be where he is. Now, Paul's talking about the same thing here. And the focus is the same. We will be with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This is our glorious hope. We will be with Jesus forever. There is nothing better. Verse 18, Paul says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see, knowing with complete certainty that all believers, whether dead or alive, when Jesus comes, knowing that all believers will be with Jesus, will be taken to meet Jesus, and will be with him forever, gives us confidence and joy. We can live looking forward to this reality. It's not just wishful thinking. It's real hope. It's reality. We may not know everything that will happen in our lives in the future, but we know that one day we will be with Jesus forever and life will be perfect there's nothing more encouraging and we need to remind each other of this awesome truth to encourage each other and also when Christians mourn uh, the, the death of another believer this truth brings hope and it consoles the brokenhearted because we know that they will be raised to be with Jesus and we will all be gathered together and we will be with Jesus forever. You know that old saying, life is hard and then you die? <laughs> and I think a lot of times we go, yeah. Well, you know, that might be true, but as followers of Jesus, we could change that saying. And we can say, you know, life may be hard, but then you go to be with Jesus. Now that's encouraging. Well, as we continue, Paul is still looking forward to Jesus' return. But now he writes about living with anticipation. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, so, so Paul now shifts from talking or speaking specifically of the rapture to speaking of the day of the Lord. And so first we need to understand what is meant by the day of the Lord. And I'm going to put this very simply. Uh, but this title comes from the Old Testament. And it refers to uh, a time when God comes to both judge and deliver. 
This idea comes up a lot in the Old Testament prophets. In fact, in our study, we saw that a lot. We've talked about the day of the Lord recently in our study in the prophets. And, and we've, we've uh, as we saw this, we, we saw that the idea of the day of the Lord developed through the prophets to include the coming of the Messiah who will conquer his enemies and will establish his kingdom and rule from Jerusalem. Then this idea of the day of the Lord is picked up in the New Testament and is further explained as the coming of Jesus, which makes sense because Jesus is the Messiah. And so it talks about the coming of Jesus and, uh, and it talks about ju judgment for sin and salvation for God's people and the establishment of Jesus' kingdom here on earth. And by the way, the development of the idea of, day of the, the day of the Lord is another evidence of the deity of Jesus. Because if you read at the first mentions of it in the Old Testament, who is coming to judge and deliver? God. All right? And we get all in the New Testament, who is coming to judge and deliver? Jesus. God. Okay? The deity of Jesus. Okay. Back to the day of the Lord. Now, one thing that can be confusing when we read about the day of the Lord is that it doesn't necessarily refer to one single day, but to a time period. And so the day of the Lord will, will be initiated by the rapture of the church when Jesus comes and believers are taken to meet Jesus in the sky. Then this sets in motion the great tribulation in which God's wrath is poured out against sin, which is followed by Jesus' return to earth, the battle, of the, Arm the battle of Armageddon, and the establishment of the millennial kingdom. So having established that, let's go back to the text. So once again, Paul says that he doesn't need to explain to them uh, about the timing of the day of the Lord. In other words, he's already taught them this. He's already taught them that we don't know when Jesus is coming, when he will return. Most likely he told them what Jesus told his disciples when they asked about the timing. Things like that only the Father knows when. Uh, that there will be wars and famines and earthquakes, but those are just normal things that happen in the world. So even if you're looking for signs, you can't know when he's coming. But living right, living a godly life in anticipation of his return uh, is what we are called to do so that we are ready whenever he returns. And Paul continues those ideas here that there's no reason to speculate as to when Jesus will return because whenever he comes, it will be a surprise. It will surprise you. In other words, you know he's coming but you don't know when. And when he does come, Paul says it will be like a thief in the night. Now, when thieves rob houses and get away with it, thieves are successful in robbing those homes because the owner doesn't know when they're coming. Right? Because if they did know when, they'd be standing there on guard. They'd be ready. All right? And so he's saying, this is the picture. It's a surprise. And he continues to build on this idea. And look at verse 3. He says, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So as Christians, we know Jesus is coming, just not when. But other people will be caught totally unaware. Non-believers will be living life and they will be sure that they've got everything under control and they'll be thinking the, uh, that they are perfectly secure and they aren't concerned about their peace being broken. But then it will happen like a thief in the night. Suddenly they will find themselves under attack. Destruction will come out of nowhere. In other words, God's wrath will come upon them. 
Now, at this point in the passage, this is where people start having discussions about the rapture. If the rapture happens earlier than the judgment, or if it's basically the uh, all simultaneous same event, because it, it seems kind of like he's talking about it like it's the same event. And, uh, the thing is, is Paul isn't trying to give us a detailed explanation of all of the sequential steps of the end times here. And like many, also like many prophetic passages, it, these events seem to be telescoped. What I mean by that is, you know, like when you look at something from the distance, you might see a peak here and a peak here and a peak here, but they look really close together. Okay, so we have, sep we have events separated by times, but they kind of appear close. Uh, I'll give you an example of how this happens in Scripture. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, it talks about Jesus' coming. And uh, in the prophets that we were looking at, talked about Jesus is going to come, he's going to uh, conquer his enemies and establish his, uh, his kingdom. But now we know that Jesus came and there's a time period between when he's going to come again and establish his kingdom. But the Old Testament just it made it look like it was all going to happen right at the same time, right away. And so I think there's telescoping here in First and Second Thessalonians as well. well. We may discuss this more in Second Thessalonians, but for now I'll leave it at that. Um, because if we get too far into this discussion, we'll miss the actual point that Paul is making here. But this sudden destruction is described as coming on like labor pains. The thing about labor is if, even though a woman is pregnant, and even though she may know that the baby's coming soon, and, and, and in the old days they didn't, we have better, a better idea now, too. We'll gi they'll give you a due date. It's usually wrong, but you know, it's, you, know, you, you know it's in that time period, right? But even though you know the baby's coming, when, you, when that first contraction hit, it's just a surprise, right? It's not like, oh, I knew that was happening, going to happen right now. It's a surprise, okay? And, and all of a sudden it goes, uh-oh, we got to start doing stuff, right? And so that's, that's the point here. It, it hits. It's a surprise but not only that, it brings sudden pain. And this pain, talking about the wrath of God here, this pain will be unavoidable. Those who are overtaken by God's wrath will not escape. It says they will be judged for their sin. Verse 4. It says, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Now, this is good news. When Jesus returns, it will be a different experience. Well, good news for us anyways. <laughs> it will be a different experience for believers than for non-believers. Christians are not in darkness. But non-believers are in darkness. They live in the sphere or the, the realm of sin. They can't see clearly because of the darkness. Their thinking and their understanding and their judgment is impaired. It's shrouded by sin so that they, uh, they will be completely surprised. They won't even be aware that Jesus is coming and what that means. But this statement in verse 4 is interesting because it, it implies that believers won't be surprised. Now, we've just been talking about that. It's a surprise. Like it's even, but the thing is, is, the timing will be a surprise, but we can be ready. We don't know when Jesus is coming, but we know he's coming. And we can live in anticipation of his return so that we are not caught unaware or unprepared. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. It says, For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. He says, We're not in darkness because we belong to the light. The basic idea is that Christians belong to a different realm and they live with spiritual understanding that is given by God. And so their minds are no longer darkened by the reign of sin in their lives, and their lives are not ruled by sin. Christians are of the day, in other words, of holiness, and they have spiritual insight and belong to Jesus. 
He continues, verse 6, says, So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. He's tying all these pictures together, but he's still using the picture of light and darkness. But he's now making an exhortation of how we are to live. And the point is, he's saying that we are to live differently than those who are of the night and of the darkness. He says, stay awake and be sober rather than asleep and drunk. You see, the world or non-believers are in darkness. They're, they're of the night, so they sleep and get drunk. He's not talking about literal sleep here and drunk, but he's using this as an illustration. So he says, they sleep and get drunk, but believers, they aren't of the night, so they don't. They stay awake, and we're to be sober. But what's that mean? Well, sleep here, it, it pictures someone who is unaware or indifferent of what's happening. Because you're asleep. When you're asleep, you don't know what's going on around you. A bunch of things could be happening, and if you don't wake up, you have no idea. And so the person who's asleep, he's not paying attention, and he's ignorant of spiritual realities. And then drunk here pictures someone who doesn't have control of his own senses and can't think straight. He can't respond to the truth and to spiritual things or make good choices. A person who's asleep and drunk isn't ready for action. He's not prepared for anything. And he won't do what he's supposed to do. So the point here is that Christians are not in darkness, so they shouldn't live like those who are. He said we should be different. So pay attention to what's happening around you. Be aware of spiritual realities. Hold to spiritual priorities and know the truth and live in light of that truth while waiting for Jesus to come. Live what Jesus taught, knowing that he could return at any time. And use self-control. Live with self-discipline and with God-focused uh, readiness. We're not of the darkness, so don't live like it. He continues on, verse 8. He says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, this further describes what he means by be sober or self-controlled and ready for Jesus. And he uses the, the illustration of a soldier and his armor. Now, we're familiar with this uh, illustration, although it's slightly different because in, in uh, it, my mind just blank, Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians, uh, he talks about the armor of God. But here he talks about it slightly different. He, but he's using the same illustration. Uh, you see, a soldier gets ready for battle by putting on his armor. It, it, without his armor, he's unprotected, he's unprepared, and he won't be able to fight very well. In the same way, believers are to be ready and actively live out their faith while they wait for Jesus. We are to be armed, what's he say, with faith, hope, and love. We live by faith with confidence in the truth and knowing that Jesus will return. We live in love as we obey Jesus and follow the ways of Jesus. And we have hope. We have the confident expectation of our salvation. We know with complete certainty that we have eternal life with Jesus and that we will be rescued from the coming wrath. So armed with these things, we can think clearly. We can avoid discouragement, and we can live with purpose and hold firmly to what we know so that we can live in faithful obedience to God while we wait for what's coming in the future. In verse 9, it says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. 
This is where our confidence comes from. Jesus died for us. Jesus died to take the punishment for our sin so that we could be forgiven and saved. Everyone who belongs to Jesus is not destined for wrath. In other words, we won't suffer under God's judgment. God's judgment will come against sin and sinners during the day of the Lord. But Christians will be delivered from that judgment because they believe in Jesus and belong to Jesus. Jesus took the punishment, the judgment for us when he died. And because of that, we have certainty of our salvation, our salvation from judgment, and certainty of our eternal life. But if you're here today and you don't have that certainty, you can. Because God offers his salvation freely to all people. God created us to have a relationship with him. But our sin broke that relationship. Our sin separated us from God. Our sin destined us for wrath, for judgment. Uh, uh, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. What we deserve, what we earn because of our sin is death. Judgment from God. Separation from God. But Jesus came and died on the cross to take the punishment that we deserved. He took it in our place so that we could be forgiven. God's word says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Everyone who believes in Jesus, put their trust in him, trust in his death on the cross, paid the price for their sin, will be forgiven of their sin, will be saved from judgment, will be reconciled to God, brought into right relationship with God, can live for him now and live with Jesus forever. That is the good news. The Bible teaches us, believe in Jesus and you will be saved. But Paul says something else here. He says, we will live forever with Jesus, whether we are asleep or awake. The interesting thing is he's using the same words for asleep and awake that he used in verse 6. It's a different word than he was using earlier in uh, the end of chapter 4. And so we should understand this the same way that we understood it in verse 6. In verse 6, he was talking about being spiritually aware and living in anticipation of Jesus' return. So Paul just told us to live spiritually alert and ready for Jesus' return rather than in spiritual apathy or ignorance. But now he's making the point that even if we fall short in this, and don't do it perfectly, we will still be saved because of the death of Jesus. In other words, salvation is not earned. It's not earned by obedience. It's given by grace. Even though we are to live in obedience, and it only makes sense uh, for those who belong to Jesus to live in obedience, to live right while in, in anticipation of his return, all believers will live with Jesus forever. And then he wraps it up in verse 11 and says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So a proper understanding of our salvation and our future with Jesus brings encouragement. Paul tells us to use this truth of our future hope to encourage each other. In other words, comfort those who may be mourning or in distress with this truth. We have hope. We know what will happen to those believers who have already died. They will live with Jesus along with those who are still alive when he remains. And build each other up with this truth, with this hope, 
See, knowing this and repeating this truth can strengthen the weak. It can encourage our faith. And this will then help us to live out our faith. So encourage one another with these words. And just one other thing before we wrap this up. When we read this passage in Thessalonians, is it about fascination or encouragement? I'll explain what I mean by that. Some people read these verses and, and, and they completely miss the point because they are fascinated with the end times. I mean, they're like, oh, we're talking about the future, something we don't know. Oh, can we know this? Who's this? What is that? How is that? How? And they just start asking all the questions and they're, they're fascinated with these things that they don't know. The thing is, is yes, Paul is talking about the end times here, but his focus is on Jesus. Jesus is coming and we will be with him. But some people read this and only to look at it and to decipher, well, is this pre-trib rapture or a post-trib rapture? Or is there really a rapture at all? Is it just one thing? I'm not saying that is wrong to study or understand the end times. But don't miss the actual message here. Jesus is coming. And all believers will be gathered to him and be with him forever. And this is to encourage us. Paul's not writing to stir up fascination, but to encourage. And to remind us to encourage each other with these truths. So I started this morning saying, do you need encouragement? Well, we have encouragement. The best encouragement is firmly grounded in reality, firmly grounded in truth. And this is the truth. Jesus died to pay for our sins. Everyone who believes in Jesus is saved from judgment and has eternal life. Jesus is coming again. And all believers will be with him forever. So be encouraged. <laughs>